O Lord, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, this sermon is all about worth. It's about the surpassing worthiness of Jesus. It's about the far less worthy things that you and I are prone to give our lives to. And ultimately, it's about how Jesus, in spite of our brokenness, makes us worthy of himself. It's also a sermon based on our reading this morning from the fifth chapter of the Revelation to St. John. So let's begin by first taking a minute to see the overall picture of what's going on in the book of Revelation. Now, Revelation is probably the most perplexing book in all of the New Testament. It's filled with all of these otherworldly visions and signs that can be really hard to make sense of, leaving a lot of people to simply steer away from reading it at all. But with a little bit of context, Revelation really opens up into this awe-inspiring vision of God's beauty and grace as seen in Jesus. So the book's name comes from its very first sentence, which tells us that we are about to read the revelation of Jesus Christ and that this revelation was given to John. And the word revelation is translated from the Greek word apocalypse. We use this word too, and apocalypse simply means an uncovering. So in the first chapter of Revelation, John tells us that he was on the island of Patmos, a little tiny island in the Aegean Sea between Greece and Turkey, and that he was in the spirit on the Lord's day when God revealed to him or uncovered a vision of things in the heavenly realm, things that were going to come to pass in the days ahead. And the entire book is about this vision. It's about John stepping from this world of the things that are visible into the world of the things that are invisible, and then reporting back to us the things that he's seen. It's also important to keep in mind that Revelation is a book written to Christians who are facing hard times. So the church in John's day was enduring a harsh persecution throughout the Roman Empire. So one of Revelation's main themes is that in spite of everything going on in the world, that in the end, God wins. It's saying to those persecuted first century Christians that though right now it might look like we're going to be wiped out, though it may look like the gospel is going to fail, we know that Jesus has already won and that he's going to come back one day to put all things right. So all of the images and the symbols in the book of Revelation are written to encourage and strengthen Christians who are suffering with the certainty that Jesus has and will overcome the world. So our reading today picks up right in the middle of John's vision. So in chapters 2 and 3, John is given messages to take and to deliver to specific churches. And then at the beginning of chapter 4, John is taken up into the divine throne room in heaven. And when he gets there, he sees God seated on his throne, and God is surrounded by 24 elders, 12 for the tribes of Israel, 12 for the apostles. And there are four living creatures, one that looks like a lion, one that looks like an ox, one that looks like a man, and one that looks like an eagle in flight. And all of them are giving worship and praise to God. So our reading today from chapter 5 picks up right here. And we read that there's a scroll in the hand of the one who is on the throne. It's a scroll in God's hand. And the scroll presumably contains all of the events that are about to unfold in God's victory, his final victory over sin and death. And a mighty angel asks the question, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? Well, John tells us that he looks in heaven, and he looks on the earth, and he looks under the earth, and that no one, not a single person, is found worthy to open this scroll. And this causes John to weep in sorrow. But then, one of the elders tells John to stop weeping, because there is someone worthy. And he says that the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered, so that he can open the scroll. 
And then there appears a lamb, standing as though it's been slain. And this lamb goes and takes the scroll, and the whole company of heaven and all the creatures on earth praise this slain lamb as being the one who's worthy. Well, John's account of this vision makes it pretty clear that this one who alone is worthy to open the scroll is Jesus himself. Jesus, who's of the house and lineage of David, as we read in Luke's gospel. Jesus, the lion of Judah. Jesus, who is the once for all Passover lamb who was slain for the sins of the world. And why is Jesus worthy? We learn from the elder that speaks to John that Jesus is worthy because he's conquered. So what has Jesus conquered? Well, he's conquered all evil, Satan, sin, and death. And how has Jesus conquered these things? By suffering and by dying. So even here in the heavenly realm, after Jesus has raised from the dead and ascended to the right hand of the Father, Jesus is shown to John as a slain little baby sheep, as a lamb. And this is because it's Jesus' suffering and dying that actually prove him to be worthy. The author of the letter to the Hebrews tells us that Jesus was not only crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, but also that he was made perfect through suffering. And this is because Jesus' suffering and death has reconciled us, you and me, to God. So Jesus came to be the great and final high priest who offered not the blood of bulls and goats, but instead to offer his own perfect, unblemished, and completely worthy life for the sins of the whole world. And by giving up his life, Jesus has bought us back from slavery and servitude to Satan and sin that we might have abundant life in him. The pages of the New Testament present Jesus and the gospel message of forgiveness that he's won for us as being the single most valuable thing that there is. Jesus is the pearl of great price that the merchant, when he sees it, sells everything else he has in order to buy it. Jesus is the treasure that's hidden in a field that when you find it, you then go and sell everything you own so you can buy that field. And the question that this passage from Revelation puts before you and me this morning is this. Do we actually find Jesus this worthy? Worthy of our time, of our treasure, worthy of our hearts, worthy of our lives? The reformer John Calvin once called the human heart a factory of idols. And how easy is it for us to take things that are far less worthy than Jesus, but give them a place of prominence in our lives. So back in Revelation chapter 2, when John is being given these specific words for churches by God, God says to the church in Ephesus that they have forgotten their first love. So that they once had known the worthiness of Jesus and his love, but that over time they've drifted away, and that now their love has grown cold. And how good we are, too, at forgetting our first love, the love of the one who bled and died for us even when we were his enemies. How good we are at forgetting that we've died with Jesus and have been raised to a new life with him, that in Christ we are now new people, that we're a new creation. How good we are at neglecting so great a savior and so great a salvation, all for such less worthy things. There's a phrase in the confession of sin found in morning and evening prayer in the older prayer books where we ask God to have mercy upon us miserable offenders. And I think that that phrase miserable offenders pretty well describes us on some days. The Apostle Paul, whose miraculous conversion we read about in Acts this morning, encountered Jesus and found him worthy of giving his whole life for. So though Paul had a good trade as a tent maker and he was highly educated in all things pertaining to the Jewish faith, he gave all of it up 
to travel the world preaching about the worthiness of Jesus, planting and nurturing churches, and eventually dying for that faith. In a letter that he wrote to the church in Philippi, Philippians, Paul tells them of this great status that he had had in his previous life. And then he goes on to say that whatever I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Paul very much knew the worthiness of Jesus. And whilst Paul traveled around the world and he planted churches and then he moved on to new places to plant other churches, he would correspond with these young congregations that he had planted about problems happening within them. So the Corinthians wrote Paul about the absolutely scandalous stuff that certain members of the church were doing. And it's really scandalous. Go read 1 Corinthians and find out. Crazy stuff. Paul had to write the church in Galatia, write the Galatians, after hearing that they were abandoning the gospel and instead were embracing a false gospel. And every time Paul had to write to one of these churches, what did he do? What did he say? Well, he didn't start by telling them to just follow the rules. He didn't start by telling them to just try harder to be better people. Now, what Paul first did is he pointed them back to the cross. Paul pointed them back to the event that he believed most showed Jesus to be worthy of us giving our entire lives to. And the reason Paul pointed these wayward believers back to the cross is that Paul believed that in the blood of the lamb who was slain, there was a power so great that it could not only wash miserable offenders clean, but it could also raise them to new life. So what about us? You and me who so often mistakenly think that things other than Jesus are worthy of building our lives on. You and me who so easily forget our first love and run after cheap imitations. Well, I think that when we find ourselves wooed by the things of this world or by the idol factory that's within our hearts, that we follow Paul's lead and we go back to the cross. We go back to the place where we most clearly see the beauty and the worthiness of Jesus. The place where the most worthy lamb died in our stead in order that he might make us worthy of himself. In Philippians 3, right after Paul tells us that he counts all things loss for the sake of Christ, he also then goes on to tell us why he counts all things as loss. And he says that he's counted all things as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus as his Lord. We can look in heaven and on earth and under the earth, just like John did in his vision but nowhere will we find anything else in all of creation that's worthy of giving our lives to other than Jesus. Nowhere else will we find someone who's more deserving of our praise or our talents or our treasure than the Lord Jesus. Nowhere else will we find pardon for sin but in Jesus. Nowhere else will we find perfect love but in Jesus. And nowhere else will we find new and abundant life but in Jesus. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. To him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Amen.